What's going on, everybody? Lil Chris here, and I finally got another interview for an episode of Pool Talk. It's going to be me again, except this time, I'm actually going to get interviewed. When I had published my Playing the Ghost in Nine Ball for a Race to Three video, I was wearing this exact shirt from the Cue It Up apparel line that I had gotten from winning third place in a spot shot challenge held by Fast and Loose Design. And I had shared that video on the Cue It Up's Facebook page. And because of that, the owner of Cue It Up reached out to me and asked me if I'd be interested in appearing on their podcast, which I happily accepted. Now, the owner of Cue It Up lives in Wisconsin, and because I live here in Texas, we conducted the interview over a Zoom meeting, which was broadcasted live on their Facebook page. And I was given permission to record the interview on my end so I can publish it here on my channel. Now, the interview is a little over an hour long, so sit back and enjoy, and we'll talk a little bit more afterwards. And we are live, and I'm going to get a notification pretty soon for my phone saying we're live, and this is going to be fun. Fantastic. Yay. I look forward to it. Now we are going to exit out of this Facebook so that I don't get all those notifications. And we're going to wait for a couple minutes, and oh, cool. Neil's just sent me an email. <clears throat> Neil's fine? Yep. We are going to be doing an interview on when, I don't know when, I forgot already. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, this is, this is fun. Little sneak peek for anybody that's out there. Uh, tomorrow at 8 a.m., Neil's fine and I are going to be doing an interview together. Awesome. So we're going to have a podcast coming soon for anybody out there who wants to hear Neil's fine. How can you not want to hear Neil's fine? Howdy, Nate Mindem. What's up, Kyle Boutte? I pronounced your name right because you get mad at me every time I don't. <laughs> so uh, everybody here, uh, we are going to be doing a fun live interview with Lil Chris. So Lil Chris, how you doing? I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm living the dream. Aren't we all? Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, especially these days, right? Right. So, uh, <laughs> for anybody who may not know you or have been exposed to your great work. Give us a small rundown on who you are. Well, uh, being 39 years old, I started playing pool when I was 17 and I'm, I'm pretty much a pool player, um, but I'm also a software developer. That's what I did by trade. And it was only back in 2019 that I decided to start a YouTube channel where I would do uh, some pool lessons, uh, at least with what I know as far as the game is concerned, having played the game for over 20 years. You know, I'm not a professional or anything like that, but I, I feel that I at least have knowledge that I can pass on to others. And from what I've been told, I give instructions in such a way to where the lowest common denominator can actually pick it up. And if I can hit that low target, then everybody above that target obviously should be able to pick it up as well. So I hopefully you know, send a message to a wide audience and not just hit mid-level or anything um, above mid-level. Yeah, and you create a lot of YouTube content. So that is basically what I'm coming on to talk to you today about because, I mean, your YouTube stuff is, I mean, first off, you have 54,000 followers. Is that right? Am I, am I um, cutting you short there? I, it, it's, it's not going to be exact, but I think, yeah, uh, the exact number right now, if I just refresh, is 54,872. <laughs> That's crazy. That's, that's a lot. It's a lot of YouTube followers. Tell me and about it. You, I never would have thought about it, you know, a year and a half ago when I started. Definitely. Right. So, uh, so obviously you're not going to get that many followers anywhere close to that many followers, especially in pool without some really, really cool content. Uh, so why don't we go through like the most basic level of it first is you have pool lessons. Yes. You actually give pool lessons, but you give them in a very unique way. You don't just like sit in front of a pool table and say, Hey, do this and this and this, you actually interact while playing the game in a pretty unique way. And I think that's a lot of the reason you get a lot of the support that you do. So why don't you take us through not only the motivation that you had originally for uh, doing it to the way that you do, but uh, I guess talk a little bit about why you do it that way as well. Sure. So before I started my uh, YouTube channel, I have some videos on there where I'm actually reviewing people's games. They send me a video of them and I give my review. 
Uh, I used to, oh, I already do something like that for my APA league members because I do play in an APA league. So I had plenty of practice as far as how I'm going to interact with the camera or at least how my voice um, is going to sound on camera as well, as well as my instructions that I actually try to give to help somebody improve their game. So I already had that background as far as how to teach, but then as far as how to construct an actual video, um, I had to obviously do research. I looked at a lot of different pool channels. That's where I found Dr. Dave Billiard's pool channel, which is great, um, a bunch of, and a bunch of other ones to see how they actually portray their information. Because one, I don't want to copy them. Uh, but at the same time, like you said, I want to try to be unique if I can. And the, the biggest thing I saw that was unique was the way you described it is how I interact with the camera. And I hardly do any edits. Uh, a lot of videos uh, that are out there is where you see someone say whatever it is they're going to say. And then when they get to the demonstration part of it, there's an edit somewhere in there to where you can see it just jump from one context to the other. And mine are not like that. It's you hear me talk and then you see me demonstrate exactly what I just said. And that has at least been the um, algorithm, I guess I should say, on how I actually try to construct um, most, at least most of my uh, YouTube videos because I found that I can't do everything in one take. Uh, everybody should be aware that none of the, no YouTube videos are done in one take unless someone actually is a raw recorder because uh, that does exist. They just turn the camera on, record, and when they're done, they publish. And that's it. So everything's on the fly. Uh, with mine, I do try to be professional. So if I slur my words or once I listen to the recording, if I cannot hear every single solitary word that I meant to say in that sentence, I'll go and do a retake because I want to make sure that the message is actually crisp and clear on top of the demonstration because I can have a clear, crisp uh, message, but I could screw up on the demonstration. So I got to make sure that the two are actually uh, in sync. And then therefore I have a clip that I can set aside and then work on the next clip, but there'll be some sort of editing to transition those two clips together that actually create uh, the entire lesson. Yeah, definitely. So, okay, now we'll actually talk about the, the videos themselves because uh, we, we kind of have this background as to what you do to actually create them, but that's not to take away from the actual stuff that you talk about too, because we're about the same Fargo speed. We're about the same, about the same quality of player. And I got some stuff out of what you were doing. And, you know, I play pretty close to the same speed as you. And there's some stuff that you're talking about that I'm like, oh, yeah, that, yeah, that's, that's, that's a thing. <laughs> and it, it helped my game a little bit. So talk about the actual videos that you have as far as content and how it can help all ranges of players. Well, I think that goes back to what I said before about the, the words that I choose. I mean, as time has gone by, we've started to learn that words are actually very important. Uh, and you want to make sure that the, the words that you actually say have one meaning <laughs> and one meaning only. You don't want them to actually have double meanings uh, because then that's where misinterpretation comes in. And, and, you, and you'll obviously get the question, do you mean to say this? And like, well, crap, I chose the wrong words. If you actually say that to me, I chose the wrong words. Uh, so be, I think because I'm able to – or with practice, I've been able to break it down to such a level to where hopefully they don't ask me a question, then that's what allows them to learn because that at least tells me there was a complete understanding in what I was trying to say on top of a complete understanding at what I was trying to demonstrate uh, as well. Because obviously if the demonstration doesn't match up with the verbiage, then it just doesn't work. Uh, an example would be, I have a video where I demonstrate how to break an eight ball rack, but it's using a magic rack. And a lot of comments that I've gotten on the video will say, well, what about this or what about that? And what they're referring to is when you don't use a magic rack, there's going to be gaps in the rack. And that's the biggest variable you cannot control when it comes to a being able to predict the pattern that the balls will actually spread. Whereas in with a magic rack, all the balls are touching, which means those variables are completely in, eliminated. And the only variables that you're in control of are where you hit the cue ball, how hard you hit the cue ball, and where you strike the rack. And if you're able to repeat those three variables, then you're going to see a consistent result. And what I showed was you know, where five different balls were going to go on a consistent break. And I demonstrated that very well, but even some people are like, well, you forgot about this. Well, you forgot about that. And every comment that they were referring to dealt with using a non-magic rack. Yeah. I was like, your, your, your comment does not relate to the context in which I'm trying to provide. Your comment is correct, but it, 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 you're comparing apples and oranges. If I, if I broke with a non-magic rack and just tried to give myself a tight rack, 
I already know it's not going to be a tight rack because it's it's almost impossible for a human being with a regular rack to give a perfectly frozen magic rack type rack to to yourself or even to an opponent. So the variables Unless are going to be different. The felt. That too, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so the rack is set. But that's usually where I try to break things down. And usually when I give them that type of clarification, then they're like, the light bulb goes off. And, and so I, I start allowing people to have a more open mind as to what I'm explaining because they'll ask me, well, th it didn't work when I did this. And I'll ask them, well, did you do this? I, like, I think of the most common things that they might be forgetting, which would be use of equipment or you know, it, what's your felt like versus my felt or you know, really try to create an apples to apples comparison if, if you can. And then it starts yeah. to finally sink in. Yeah, because of, of course, if you're going to be playing on a diamond, you're going to be playing on a valley or a Brunswick. The racks are going to break a little bit differently. But for the most part, if you can if you can remove as many of the variables as you possibly can uh, by using the magic rack, by uh, you know s trying to hit the same speed, and that's where like something like a break rack really helps with, because you can actually get down to the point where you're you're hitting about the same exact speed every single time, and then you right. only have to control the strike and where you're striking. That gets pretty tough unless you're, you know, Sky Woodward or Shane Van Boning. Yeah, and they unless hit the you're ball a so perfect every time. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, let's let's talk a little bit more about the actual contents of the video itself. You have uh, diff. Well, you have. Uh, I've seen you have patterns, different pattern play uh, videos. You have how to use English, how to throw balls. You you have a bunch of different types of videos. Talk about some of the ones that you've done and uh, which maybe, maybe which ones were your favorite to create? Ooh, favorite to create. Well, I would have to say that all of them are my favorite to create. Uh, if, if I were to give a number one, I think it would have to be the one that isn't actually very popular on my channel. And that's, uh, I have a video where I say, I introduce the playing the ghost series where I actually do want to play up against the ghost and see how many times I can win versus how many times I can lose. But the very first video I made for that playlist was a parody video because I actually bought a green suit and I would play the ghost, uh, and purposely miss at points in time, run off camera, change into the green suit, come back on and try to run the table. And if I'm successful, then that's a clip that I actually keep. But when I run that clip through my video software, I green screen myself out. So all you actually see is a facade of a player that's actually playing that runs the table. And uh, that one right there was a boatload of fun to actually create. It just wasn't as popular as I thought it, uh, it would have been, but it doesn't, to me, the popularity of the video doesn't matter, even though we would say that YouTube views do matter. But for me, I had so much fun making that video, and it's forever on the internet now. So if it ever gets its exposure and starts to become an actual trend, then that's something that uh, I can actually do. But like Because of that video and what I did, something very similar, and I'm going to go ahead and spoil it for everybody if someone beats me to the punch, Halloween, I planned on trying to get a uh, – uh, what is it? Um, a – why do I not stormtrooper stormtrooper uh, <laughs> costume because they never miss or they all, they always miss. So I want to yeah, be the storm. Yeah. I want to be the stormtrooper that, that doesn't miss and actually runs the table for that type of connection. If there's actually anybody that watches it, that realizes what I'm trying to do, like always oh, dressed up as a stormtrooper. They're always supposed to miss. But wait, this one's not missing. Like that's the, that's the parody that's actually supposed to happen. Cause I have gotten comments on that video where like someone actually did say, how come you're not chalking up as often? And the first thing I want to go is like, you do realize this is a joke video. Like, it doesn't matter what I do in this video. This is, this is not a serious video. <laughs> that's, yeah, that, that's, that's pretty fun stuff. Uh, so, the, but, the, but the more, I guess, um, the more serious videos that you do as far as the, if somebody has never been exposed to your channel and they're looking to get better at the game, uh, talk about the, the, the more serious videos that you have that could actually help to improve somebody's game. Sure, so that's where my original playlist would come into play because I do organize all my videos into playlists. I try to keep my uh, YouTube channel very nice and organized where it's easy to find stuff and that's all the pool lessons. Uh, the only thing that I saw sometimes in a lot of videos that were out there is that a lot of lessons are actually compiled together, meaning like you might see a video that talks about English in one minute and then talks about jump shots uh, in the next minute, you know, kind of thing, where I think they're two totally separate subjects to where one should kind of learn this before attempting to do this. And most of my videos, if you actually watch them in chronological order, that's 
what they're for. The very first video I did was fundamentals, how you're supposed to hold the cue, how you're supposed to stand, what the different bridge hands uh, look like. Um, and then after that, uh, how to actually uh, aim with the using the ghost ball uh, aiming method. And then after that, uh, understanding the tangent line, how the, the cue ball actually comes off of the uh, the cue ball or the uh, from the object ball that you actually hit. It's very in chronological sequence from the most basic thing that you're supposed to learn and then the things that you should almost naturally learn as you naturally progress through the game all the way up until I think my last pool lesson video had to deal with pre-shot routines. Uh, and how to try to keep a consistent pre-shot routine. And because if anybody's a pool player that's out there, they know that when they see an easy shot, their pre-shot routine just goes out the window because it's just an easy shot. They just get down and shoot the ball. But if it's a super thin cut shot or if it's a bank shot or it's a kick shot, they're religiously going through their pre-shot routine. They're doing calculations. They're chalking. They're looking at all the different angles. But if it's an easy shot, they don't do that. And the pre-shot routine that I'm talking about basically says it doesn't matter the difficulty of the shot maintain the consistency but i'm not perfect even i don't maintain the consistency but at least the lesson is out there for other people that want to learn because as you get better some of those habits just happen to creep into where it's like oh whatever i can make this with my eyes closed and that's yeah. exactly how you're going to treat the shot practice as i say not as i do yeah <laughs> but yeah, i do exactly. try to in in my videos i do try to portray what i teach as well because i don't want there to be a controversy uh in like well you said this but you're doing this and actually a lot of that stuff is actually starting to bleed into my game as well which people are starting to notice that my game is even going higher and i was like well i, I guess that also has nothing to do with the fact that i'm actually practicing while i'm making a youtube video like practicing is also yeah. making me better it's not because of you know stuff yeah. like this because you can have bad fundamentals and still be an awesome pool player like i, I know people that have you know what i would consider to be very bad fun of fundamentals but they're better than me so it's like they figured something out francisco bustamante yeah, with the up and down, exactly. Like that's any any pool. But he hits the ball so good. <laughs> exactly, any pool instructor would tell you like that's a no no. You shouldn't do that because you're yeah. you're you don't know where you're actually going to strike the cue ball. And if you if you mean to put bottom left and you actually hit you know more towards the center because you're bowing your cue up and down. But a professional like Bustamante or even Efren Reyes, they spent years perfecting you know the bad yeah. habit, and they got it to work for them. Yeah. That's, and that's, that's what it is, right? There's, there's different ways of getting good, right? You could do the 10,000 hours or you can do the 100,000 hours with crap mechanics. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Efren, Efren Reyes and, uh, I mean, Efren Reyes and Francisco Bustamante are some of the, the greatest pool players of the last 20 years. And they don't have the greatest mechanics. No, they don't. But they but hit they... the ball so pure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that, yeah. that's why I love the people that try to argue, well, what about the pros? And I'm like, come on, please stop trying to make an apples to orange comparison. You're talking about people that have invested their life into the game versus people that are trying to learn the game. It's, it's not a fair comparison. Yeah, for sure. So uh, basically, uh, I guess going back to the question, you have – plenty of videos for just about any player's ability whether it's somebody who's just basically got a table for the first time and they haven't picked up a pool key before or you know the touring professional where you know they have little bits here and there i mean they probably already know the things but it's, it's a reinforcement you have you have things along the way very in-depth detailed uh minute details plus the very basic fundamental stuff yeah, because I, I think what ends up happening, because I know it happened to me uh, before I got to the level of where I'm at, is as you learn, even after you learn whatever it is you learn, next thing you know, instincts come into play. And a lot of people out there will say, well, I, I do this by feel. And I was like, that's fine that you do that by feel, but what you don't know behind that feel is mathematics, physics, and stuff. like. And Dr. Dave is the greatest at explaining a lot of that stuff. Yes. The the only thing with mine is that I try to explain that same exact stuff, but at a more rudimentary level uh, so that hopefully other people can pick it up. You know, so I mean, like to me, Dr. Dave is my inspiration as far as creating the content. I, I see what he's done and I obviously don't want to mimic it, but then when I look at the words that he chooses, I'm like, yeah, I get it. But who uh, below me does not get it. And so what do I need to say differently from him that allows them to get it uh, as well? And that's, and not just to pick on Dr. Dave, because like I said, he's uh, my favorite YouTube channel. Um, 
other YouTubers as well. And that's to say the same for me, because again, if someone asks me a question uh, as a comment, that already tells me that I didn't explain it good enough. And I need to try to figure out what do I need to say better to be able to appeal to them. Because again, if I'm appealing to them, then I already know I'm appealing to people that understood if I chose different or you know higher words or higher educated words or anything like that. Because I want to make sure I hit as much people as possible. With the uh, understanding that I'm not going to get 100%, I don't aim for that, but I do try to hit a vast majority uh, of my audience. So that, like you said, from the beginner all the way to the immediate and even some of the advanced, if I've you know in, in enlightened you on a, a couple of subjects and we've uh, played pretty much the same speed, is because one, you probably just never thought of it that way. And then hearing it for the first time, that's when the light bulb goes off and goes, oh, well, that makes sense. Now I have a better understanding. And that's the philosophy that I try to at least put into a lot of my lessons is that if you have a better understanding, then you can have more discoveries uh, to go along with it. And it's not just a whole lot of guesswork. Yes, for sure. And uh, uh, was it Jasper, Jasper Gann? I hope I pronounced that right. You don't need to be a great player to be a great teacher. And you don't need to be a great teacher to be a great player. That's, that's a pretty good one. That's a, that's a good line. I mean, Tiger Woods is the greatest golfer for my money in the entire world, and he still had a coach. Yeah, exactly. And if you look at a lot of professional coaches out there, some of them weren't professional players. You know, they just Johan. they just studied the game and understood the strategies and mechanics, and then and then taught you know whoever their their team members were. It's it's basically the same exact thing. Yeah, Johan Ryusink. Uh, I think I, I think that's how you pronounce his last name, Ryusink. The the U.S. Moscone Cup captain for the last couple of years. He he doesn't play pool at all, but he's one of the. He's probably the best billiard instructor in the world at this yeah. point. So, so uh, let's go back to your YouTube channel a little bit more. Sure. And uh, I guess let's let's pull it up here for anybody who's never been there. So I'm going to be covering up our faces, and I'll get rid of all this stuff. Here is your channel. It is because we haven't given the plug for it yet. We have Lil Chris, and I'll just use this to cover up my face because we don't need to see my face anyways. Oh, that's the wrong one. All right, here we go. This is how the sausage is made, people. <laughs> All right. So we have right here Lil Chris, and uh, we have the playlists. We have, let's see, you even have, so this is, this is actually why I wanted to come on here. You don't even have all pool videos. You have a C-sharp programming lessons. You yeah. have... Uh, you have some weightlifting stuff in here, some uh, some body, well, I shouldn't say bodybuilding stuff, but kind of, right? A 30-day push-up challenge, 30-day bicep workout challenge. There's some fun stuff on here. Yeah, so like the, the common thing that's on YouTube is that usually a YouTube channel is dedicated to one specific thing. And so my YouTube channel is dedicated to one specific thing. That's me, you know, not one specific subject. So like the very first videos that I actually uh, started to do were, were fitness videos because I do like to work out. I like to stay physically fit. I've actually gone by the wayside over the last uh, uh, year or so, and especially over the last couple of months. Uh, we don't have to get into that subject, uh, but Welcome I'm starting my life. <laughs> exactly. But I'm starting to get back into it. I've been, uh, I've been going back to the gym regularly. And when I started, my best friend wanted to start with me. And so the things we started with were, you know, physical fitness challenges. The very first thing we tried to do to see was who can grow the, the biggest biceps uh, in 30 days, you know, kind of thing. So we structured a specific workout routine that we were going to do both do uh, without swaying uh, off so that there's no cheating um, and specific workout days where we work out in the gym and where we work out at home, et cetera, et cetera. We took before measurements and after measurements. Now, my friend is much bigger than me, so naturally he's already going to have a bigger bicep. So we were measuring the difference from the beginning measurement to the end measurement. And whoever had the biggest difference uh, was the winner. We ended up in a tie. Uh, which I was happy about because I clearly thought my friend <laughs> would have uh, blown me out of the water. But if you look at those videos, they're not popular at all. They, they have like less than a thousand views. And it wasn't until I started making the pool instructional videos, which I already had in mind to do, that the channel finally started to take off. And it was really my banking video that really did it because I already had in this mind that if I were to become successful that I would do giveaways and stuff and like what were my milestones. And the first uh, giveaway was at 100 subscribers and then 1,000 and then 10,000 and then 25,000 and then 50,000. Uh, but when I got my 100 uh, subscriber, from 100 to 1,000, in between there was when I released my bank video. 
And I had already was planning on giving doing my first giveaway for 100, uh, 100 subscribers, but I was playing in a BCA state tournament. And while I was in that BCA state tournament, my phone was just blowing up. Like I, I just kept getting all these email notifications. This person subscribed, this person subscribed, this person subscribed. And I start looking at my subscriber count and I go from 100 to 300. And I check it an hour later to 500. I check it a couple hours later. Just, I'm like, holy crap, I'm gonna get to 1,000 before I even get to do uh, the 100 uh, subscriber giveaway. And I was just completely blown away by that. And, and that's where everything really started to take off. And clearly I want to appeal to my audience. I know my audience wants to see more pool videos so those do take priorities but every now and again i just mingle in something else like my programming videos uh, and the programming is because i used to be a adjunct faculty member after i graduated with my master's degree the college at which i graduated from offered me a job to to teach programming and i took it and uh, taught three classes for three semesters it was two she two c sharp uh courses and one c plus plus course so having I the C++. yeah, so having the background as an instructor also comes from my philosophy of being able to hit the lowest common denominator. Because when I'm actually lecturing in front of students, I can actually physically see uh, my students and see their body reactions and you know hear the um, hear their voices to know whether or not if they're actually getting anything. And if I see someone not getting something, I do start to think, well, how do I restructure my lesson to get that person? Because if I get that person, that means I've got everybody. Uh, in the classroom because I don't really want anybody to get left behind. Sometimes I'm successful, sometimes I'm not. I mean, that's just the way it is. But that philosophy is what goes into my YouTube videos. Yeah, and that definitely shows up in the in the videos. Raleigh Williams is watching. Hi, Raleigh. Maybe he's left already. But <laughs> the average pool player. I love his channel. <laughs> yeah, Raleigh's Raleigh's the best. He's the absolute best. Uh, so I guess I guess uh, we could chat a little bit more about some of the other stuff that you have on the playlist because uh, I guess we have break and runs in here. We have playing the ghost and anybody out there that's watching, first off, go over and subscribe to him for sure. Uh, this is the the pool coaching lessons. You can't see what right now because I'm <laughs> you can't see my screen, but the, everybody else can, and uh, it shows all these different channels and or I should play uh, playlists, I should say, uh, but. You also have that uh, that T-shirt on, <laughs> and you won uh, you won that from your yeah. Spock shot challenge. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So uh, this is these videos right here. You actually won that for doing a Spock shot challenge. So you like to partake in a lot of the different uh, fast and loose designs uh, challenges that are out there, and you can win some prizes on them. That's pretty cool. And then you upload them all to your Facebook page. Well, the, the, the thing about that was a buddy made me aware of the fast and loose design uh, challenge. The, the spot shot challenge itself, um, I have video, uh, a video or two prior to the actual thing because I've already actually done it before. There was already a viral video when uh, it was mentioned that Sky uh, Woodward had done, I think it was 24 or 26 spot shots in a row on a nine foot table so dumb. <laughs> and it's then so good. yeah and then dr dave made an instructional video on doing the spot shot challenge and that's when i responded dr dave did a video where he did six and i'm like okay i think i can beat six and i go and try it i'm like crap this is harder than i thought but i eventually do beat it and then uh i i, I thought i was going to turn it into an actual series to where like you know i would do this every so often and try to get higher numbers but when I saw that it just wasn't very popular, then it's like, okay, again, I want, I do want to appeal to my audience. So I kind of left it by the wayside. And then a buddy messages me, hey, check this out, because he knows I've done a video and he's done a video on it as well. And we're like, okay, now I have a reason to try it again. And so I at least did, I think, two more submissions of the Spot Shot Challenge. Uh, one that I, I, I submitted twice to the, uh, to the Fast and Loose Design uh, Challenge, and it was good enough to get me third place, at least for an eight-foot table. I... I uh, unfortunately would have to disagree with the idea that seven footers and eight footers were categorized together while the nine footer was uh, off on yeah. its own. But, you know, it's not my challenge. I don't make the rules. I was just happy to, to be able to participate because the, the, the person, the one person that won first and second place, the same person, uh, won, fir <laughs> won first and second place with a submission of 27 balls, I think it was, on a seven-foot table, and then uh, 18 for, for second place. 18 was their original submission, and then they beat themselves with a, with a 27, which was ridiculous. Even for a seven-foot table, that's just ridiculous. 
that that's uh, I I tried it as well. Um, I got to two once, <laughs> and then I'm just like, this is stupid. I'm done with this, and I rage quit. I just <laughs> totally rage quit. I I'm not even not even ashamed to say it. I totally rage quit. It's spot shots are so hard. I hate, hate them. I hate them so much. <laughs> But uh, oh yeah, so we can we can move on from there, and let's let's move on to obviously you have fifty four thousand, almost fifty five thousand subscribers. Uh, you've already said maybe four, five, six times that you want to adhere to your base. You want to uh, you want to make videos that they want to consume, right? Yes. So without giving away any, or maybe you can. Who knows? It's up to you. Uh, what are you looking for into the future uh, to create as far as new content to continue building your your listener base and basically get the new content out there? Well, I always have in the back of my mind something that I want to try to do and turn into a video, but with the um, idea of making sure, like, how can I explain this? Like, for example, there isn't a, a lesson on Mass A shots uh, in my YouTube right now. I have one in mind. It's just that is one of the most complex types of shots that you can actually demonstrate and teach. Because it's not like I just want to make a video that says, get up to the cue ball, put your cue straight up and down, and just hit it. And like, and the, and the lesson's over. There's There's got to be some sort of methodical approach to understanding that elevation, how much English, how hard, and what can you actually – uh, use as a starting point because there's no syst there's no actual system to a mass a shot but there's got to be some way that you can teach it to where it's understandable to hopefully that someone can actually do and of course without ruining the table uh, that was one of the yeah. biggest that was one of the biggest messages that I said on my jump shot video that if you watch the way I do a jump shot I don't touch the table uh, where in but when I was learning, I obviously did touch the table. It wasn't until I got better and better at it to where I can actually strike a jump shot without worrying about uh, damaging the felt. The only damage the felt get is the fact that the cue ball skids off of the felt, which is no different how when you break. That's why there's burn marks where cue balls are uh, most commonly broke from is because uh, the felt is getting uh, worn down on. So the felt is uh, maintaining its normal damage that it gets from the cue ball from striking it uh, from a jump shot, at, at least uh, from me. Because then I watch other players that are trying to learn how to do a jump shot, and they do strike all the way through the cue ball, and that and the tip of their cue hits the felt and then bounces off the felt of the table and usually leaves like probably a rip mark uh, of some sort. But, I mean, unfortunately, that's how you're supposed to learn. I understand that businesses want to maintain their equipment and you know get it to last as long as they want. I mean, but if your business is in support of a league and the league actually supports all the legal rules, then you should allow your customer base to, you know, learn. I mean, if, if you're worried about how much it costs, you know, obviously just put up a sign that says, hey, you damage it, you help pay for it, you know, kind of thing. I don't know, but don't take away the legal aspects of the game because you want to protect your product. And I understand that you want to protect your product, but, you know, if players are going to go out of your bar or establishment and go playing a tournament, they're representing your place, which is free advertisement. So allow them to learn. Yeah, it's definitely uh it's definitely a fine line between wanting your players to have all of the weapons in the tool shed, uh, for, or all the tools in the tool shed, uh, so to speak, while also maintaining your equipment because it does. And uh, I actually jump differently than you. I actually I actually teach the follow through, but I teach the acceleration through the strike and then the just follow through of a normal shot that doesn't have to be accelerating all the way to the table. Right. So you accelerate, you accelerate through the shot and then you decelerate off of it. But you, I still follow through in the same way I would a normal shot. So if, if you're striking through the cue ball, you don't stop once you're through the cue ball, you still do the deceleration into a normal stroke follow through. Right. But I mean, there's, there's a lot of different ways of, I mean, you can look across the pool world and see that every single player teaches and shoots different ways. And it, like you said earlier, some of the things resound uh, with your listener base and then some things don't. So you have to say it a different way or you, maybe you have to teach a different way. And that's, that's what, that's what it takes to be a really good teacher in the game. Yeah. And you hit the, you hit the nail on the head uh, with what you just said there, because what I try to teach, I definitely try to portray the idea that I'm not saying that this is the way 
that you're supposed to do something. This is what works for me, and I'm trying to explain it in a way that hopefully that you can understand and see if it works for you. If it doesn't work for you, then hopefully there is another uh, instructor out there or another type of material or resource that you can use that can allow you to, to be able to understand it and obviously comprehend. Uh, that's where I've been trying to fill in the gaps when I go and look and see what other types of YouTube channels that are out there and the way people are teaching. And then, of course, I do look through the comments to see if there's any questions, because if there's questions, it's to me, it means the same thing, that whoever they were watching didn't explain something well enough because that's why there's a question. And so I try to learn from all of that, and I've taken all, all that in to what I was able to produce. Yeah. So uh, bringing it full circle, uh, you had said uh, that you are hoping to do a Massey video. Uh, Kyle Boutte said that Bob, Bob Jewett, mm -hmm. J-E-W-I-T-T, he said that he has a, a cool or a great system for Massey shots. I there, don't know I, who he is. Bob Jewett, I think, is um, a colleague of uh, Dr. Dave. I think they both uh, okay. are part of the Billiard University. Um, the, the only thing I have on Massey shots, other than experience, is an old Robert Burns video. Do you remember Robert Burns? I have all of his books. Yeah, from way back in the day. He has a uh, system that I pretty much still use today, which, again, just gives you like an idea. Because when people say there's a system, that means if you do the system, it's going to work. I'm like, no, that's not how pool works. There's, there's so much physics that change the variable of a system that always doesn't produce the outcome. But at least what the system does is gives you a starting point. And then from the starting point, that's where the experience and practice starts to come. And then you start to evolve as an actual player. Yeah, and I think that's a, that's a good way of putting it. There's there's a lot of things that you just have to have the feel for. It, going back to jump shots, jump shots are an absolute feel shot. You can't tell somebody to strike uh, a cue ball at seven miles an hour, and that's just going to work. I mean, the pool doesn't work that way, right? So yep. you have to you have to sit there and you have to teach them the fundamentals of how to hold the cue and how how to uh, how to accelerate quickly through the cue ball so that you can generate that force to get up over a ball. But until they actually have the cue in their hands and they're they're learning how to do that themselves, uh, you can you can kind of teach them how to get started. But ultimately, it's going to come down to you just got to practice. You got to yeah. get that muscle memory. You got to know how to you got to know how to strike the cue ball to be able to do that. And that's like I think that's what you're kind of getting at there with the Massey shots. Pretty much, you can read the recipe of a cookbook, but until you actually get it get in the kitchen and try cooking it, you don't have no clue yeah. what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, yep, and. Uh, that, and that is, there's definitely different levels to the, the game as far as like uh, a pre-shot routine, right? You can watch somebody do that and you can walk up to the table and do it immediately. There's, there's no practice to a pre-shot routine. You have to practice to make it second, second nature so that you don't have to think about it while you're doing it. Uh, the, the one thing that I'm teaching now big time for the people that uh, I work with is to have a pause before your last stroke. Uh, some players have it in the back of their strokes. I don't like it in the back of the strokes. Uh, if you like it, that's fine. I, I teach it for the students who would like to have it, but I like my pause right before the last stroke. That's the same way I do mine in my pre-shot routine. I said on your final stroke, you pause at the cue ball, pull back, and then fire. And my idea behind that is because, again, professionals will say pause in the back. And I'm not saying they're wrong. I just don't agree with it because, <clears> to me, it interrupts the momentum that you actually have in striking the ball. So when you actually pull back and go forward, it's almost gonna be at the same speed. Sometimes the forward stroke is actually gonna be faster than the back stroke because you're gonna put power uh, behind it. But if you put a pause in there, then you're interrupting that, that natural momentum that your arm is going to have when you actually do a final stroke. And that's the only, for me, that's the only reason why my pause is at the beginning. So that way I can just do one continuous movement for a final stroke and actually hit the ball. Correct, right. And, uh... Uh, Raleigh Williams says, ask Gaspar Gustave de Coriolis. I don't know what that means. <laughs> Raleigh, you need, you need to be more, you, you gotta, you gotta talk English to us here, man. I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume <laughs> that that's, that's probably still about the, uh, the Massé maybe I'd have to, uh, research that person's name. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not totally sure. Um, I got an idea though. I have an idea. Raleigh. Well, I'm going to invite you if you want to come talk to us. Oh, you know, fantastic. You know uh, well, I you know, know him, I know him from his uh, YouTube channel. I don't know him personally. 
Yeah, I don't know what you're up to, Raleigh. If you're uh, if you're not busy, you want to join in and chat with us, and then you can tell us what you're talking about. If I can, okay, I need to, he's the guy who derived the equation for the mass A. There's an equation for the mass A. Oh, wow. Okay. I, oh, like I said, I was, was I, I was right that it had to deal with the, uh, the mass A. So clearly, yeah, I mean, because anything you do on a, on a pool table is physics and physics are driven by mathematical formula. So I, I, I can, I can see that to be true that there is some sort of mathematical formula behind the, the mass a shot. But again, repeating yes. the formula, the variables of the formula, that's, that's the, that's the hard part. Always hitting at the correct elevation, yes. at the correct spot, at the correct speeds produce the same result. Like that's, you know, that's the thousands of hours of practice that you have to have just to be able to produce a consistent result. Yeah, and it, and it goes back to the break shot that we were talking about before. You can The magic rack fixes a lot of the variables that are out there, but you still have to strike with the same speed and the same direction and on the same spot on the cue ball. Uh, it's the same way for a mass A, right? It's the, the elevation of the cue, the striking speed, the point for which you hit the cue ball. Uh, the cloth, I think, has a lot more of an effect there, too, as, as opposed to uh, on the break shot. I think the cloth really comes into effect there. Sure. Yeah. But um, yes, yeah, so we can move on from that. Uh, I, if I don't know what you're doing, Raleigh, or if you're interested in joining with us, but you can if you'd like. Uh, but I do want to ask you because, uh, well, the 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 Mass A video you said that you're hoping to do that in the near future, and that would kind of complete off your playlist for the uh, instruction videos. Maybe you can. Maybe there's a couple more you'll think of down the road. But that, for the most part, that completes that that uh, playlist. No, uh, there there are quite a few more, but uh, it's still a matter of things, details that have to be taught. Like my fundamentals video, like almost every one of my videos, I can do a recap on and go more in depth. Uh, because every video that I have in my pool lesson is a brisk, here's the summary at the top of how to do certain things. And if you go through every one of those videos, there are questions in every single solitary one of those videos. So again, that's why I said like, I must have explained something not good enough to where like I, I just have a video on there are no questions, you know, which is next to impossible, but I tried to have yeah. the limited amount of questions as possible. So for example, in my fundamentals video, I don't go over bridging over a ball, you know, just something as simple as that. Yeah. Um, in my banks video, I mention at the end how speed and English change the outbound angle of an object ball. But I have no demonstrations of that. So I need to, you know, that video is a year old too. And I haven't even made the, the follow-up video where I said <laughs> I'm going to make a follow-up video. Uh, but I did mention it in my latest um, pool coaching lesson video because the, the player that I was reviewing um, did a bank shot and they missed short on it. And I did explain that all you had to do was either hit the ball harder or throw inside spin on it to make the rebound angle shorter and you probably would have made the shot because of how far you actually uh, missed it on. So like that video has to come out first, in my opinion, before I even attempt to teach two rail kick shots or three rail kick shots, because you have to understand though the variables that go along with that before you can even understand other than here's a diamond system, here's the rail, hit the ball and see what happens. Whoa. I've, been, I've got, this guy's more popular than I am. I'm honored. <laughs> How's it going, Raleigh? Wow, that is inaccurate, Chris. How are you, man? <laughs> I'm doing fantastic. So it's a pleasure to have I, you on I, the podcast. You know, I've never been watching a TV show and then gotten on the, the TV show. This is great. <laughs> Well, this is, what ha this is what happens when you become a legend, man. You're like you're like all of our hero. Wow, you are well, you are say... the average pool player. <laughs> Thank you so much. You know, it occurs to me that maybe that moniker uh, I shouldn't have I shouldn't have like leaned so hard into that because <laughs> now that's like it's great. I mean, I, I, yeah, because I, 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 I don't mean any insult by it at all because it's it, your 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 content is just freaking fantastic I, I love the videos that the way you oh, do man. it and stuff it's just awesome thanks i i couldn't feel i couldn't feel more similarly man your stuff is <laughs> is genuinely instructional and like <laughs> helpful and i think that's like 
really, really great. And you're doing a great thing for the pool world. Also, Nate, you're here too. What's up, dude? I'm, I'm just over here. I'm like threatened by your guys' beards right now. I, I, uh, I, sh <laughs> I just, uh, I, I feel like, I feel like I'm really like failing on my Rona beard and it's, uh, Oh, this is far from Rona. This, this is groomed. It's so, <laughs> it's so full and it's, uh, I'm so I threatened. Chris and I are doing this, this thing I like to call the, the mustache, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you, do a, you do the mustache, but then you let the beard, you're like, I, I'm not really a mustache guy. Don't worry. Like I'm a normal dude. I don't have like a full <laughs> ass 1910s handlebar mustache. I got a beard, but the mustache is the definitely the Batman of this. The it, 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 it's funny that you say that because you can't really tell on camera, but my mustache slash goatee is more predominant than my my actual beard. Oh, you got the goatee? Just kidding. <laughs> Pretty much. Oh, that's cool. That's next level. <clears throat> I have uh, I have a uh, a beard hair. Just kidding. I got that one. I got that one. You'll that's, get there. That's maybe someday. Maybe someday. So I think this is a this is this could be fun. Uh, which of you two? So Raleigh, you were you were creating a little bit of YouTube content before Chris, right? Because Chris, you're about just under two years old. De December just over two De years? December 2019 was when I released my first video, and that was just an introduction video. There was no content behind it. That's how long December I've been on December 2019 YouTube. is like six months ago. Is it? I'm sorry, 2018. Get your story straight, buddy. Now we can't believe anything you say. You, you oh, got me. Geez. You got me. You got me. Yeah, there, no, Hash, December. Hashtag fake news. I say 2019 <laughs> because that's when my YouTube uh, channel started was the year of 2019. The very first, you're right. The very first video was released on in December of 2018. I actually think it was December 31st. It was like just before the turn of the new year. Man, that's great. Um, yeah, I think, I think my the like the Kamui channel has been around for two years. I did the first like your average pool player video. I think like I had a weird accidental two year anniversary the day uh, Nate yeah. and I recorded a podcast. Yeah, it was. I think it was um, one day. I think it was one day prior. I think it was the two year anniversary of it. Um, yeah, that well, that was. I, I mean, and I didn't even think about that. You, you you pointed out how special that was. And I think that's a memory we'll always share together, Nate. And I want to thank you for that. Yeah. And that was, that was all the research that I did beforehand. I, I timed <laughs> that out perfectly. Yeah. Well, I mean, infinite more research than me, I guess. I was like, I, I know my life. I don't need to research this. Um, Cause I did. Um, and then I think I started, I can't remember exactly. I think the first video that I released on like, just like a Raleigh Williams YouTube channel was, um, the Jennifer Beretta video, um, the like full lesson with Jennifer Beretta. And I, I could be wrong. I think it's something like April, 2019 was that, that video might, might have been in March. So, uh, so Chris, when you were starting up your, your YouTube channel, how much of Raleigh's channel channel did you take from as far <laughs> as inspiration or, and this is, this ideas. will be, uh, I will be able to litigate based on your answer. So be very careful here, Chris. Uh, okay. So my whole take from Raleigh's channel and in, in comparison to what I <laughs> wanted to do with my channel was to not, was to not have celebrities. That's really the only difference because we know that the celebrities of pool is what makes pool great. However, there are more of us average pool players than there are the celebrity pool players. And that's really where uh, most of my inspiration is driven from. So when you look at the interviews that I've done, they're just regular pool players. And that, that's basically what I wanted to be able to, to – and that was coming off of you know, seeing stuff that Raleigh had done with the, the professionals out there out, that are out there. That's, that's very interesting. I think what, what uh, Chris has that he can bring to the table is uh, talent. And so since I didn't have that talent, I had to <laughs> bring celebrities to the table. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that was my motivation. I was like, can I play pool well? No. So I, I would disagree to... and say that you can play pool well. A lot of people are like. I think you're like... getting there, man. You're getting there. That's strokes, <laughs> man. You're stro I've seen some stroke shots out of you that those aren't, uh, those aren't, those aren't terrible player strokes. You gotta have one to have those. If you those were able you to do. replicate that Corey Duell draw shot, that is an awesome stroke. <laughs> yeah, that was well, wild. 
It, uh, I mean, as a lot of the commenters have pointed out, it wasn't as good as the Corey Duel draw shot. But thank you. I mean, I, I really appreciate that. And I definitely have been, like, trying really hard. I think that's, like, maybe that's that's the thing that my channel does well. It's just, like, a lot of effort is put in. And that the, the output is questionable. But effort is definitely there. So on the well, topic, though, I actually have a question because has has yeah. current events uh, deferred your U.S. Open? I know you had a whole series of training to the U.S. Open. And I was going to say that, too. I, I, before you answer that, I mean, I, I want to know how you feel knowing that you lost your U.S. Open title because you were going to win that. It's been, <laughs> it just got ripped from you. Yeah, I mean, I was I was pretty torn up about it until I realized that technically – I won every game that I played at the U.S. Open. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Which, undefeated. Undefeated. That's true. Yeah. I mean, on paper, you know, I'm one of the winningest U.S. Open participants. So, you know, I, I that that's really what made me feel better about that. Um, <laughs> the reason the reason I came on and and uh, and thought. Uh, you know, like, uh, why don't I, I make this all about me, this awesome show that I was watching, uh, <laughs> um, was because the dude, the same dude who, uh, like, pioneered the Coriolis effect, Gaspar de Coriolis, also was a big pool fan and mapped out the the uh, Massé equation for, like, where on the ball to hit it and the speed and the angle that will cause like a curve in the ball. Same dude. Hmm. I'm definitely gonna have to research yeah. that because maybe I can uh, use that as a reference because the only thing I knew in my mind to use as a reference is what do you do? What happens when you step on a soccer ball? It goes forward and then immediately comes back. Like to, to me, that's relatable. Everybody understands. Or if you step on a basketball or anything, because that is essentially the Massey effect. You have force coming straight down on a ball. The force propels the ball forward, but because the ball is spinning backwards, it comes back. That is essentially yeah. what a Massey shot is, just depending upon where you actually step on the ball, except now we're hitting a cue ball with a stick instead of using your foot. That was the relatable reference that I was going to end up uh, trying to portray uh, when I eventually try to construct that lesson. Yeah, that's like a, the the only thing that I can think of that's that is like that I've seen is when you somebody takes a hula hoop and like whips it forward yep. and it like goes forward but they've got the spin, you know, and it kind of spins back. That's sort of like a the Florian Massé where they just like whip it all the way. Yep. Um yeah, I don't know. I I I can't think of a good like it's such a irregular movement. Yeah, and that's why I haven't taught it for so long because it's so complex that I want to make sure that, one, I sound like I know what I'm talking about and then I, of course, can demonstrate uh, what I'm saying and that hopefully the vast majority of the people that watch it can actually pick it up and understand it and then go destroy somebody else's yeah. table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go on to your local league, your, your local <laughs> league tables for that. For sure. Right. Well, you guys, I mean, you guys were having a very, what I would call a scintillating conversation. And then I came in here and I blew the whole thing. So maybe I would say I you drop that. You added to it, man. It was, it was an honor to, to actually have a one-on-one -on -one conversation because my only interaction, I, even for you, I guess, would be through each other's YouTube channels. So to actually yeah. to be able to talk to you via in person online, uh, it's, it, it was an honor. We exist or like outside of pal. YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right. I'm going to, I'll hop off and you, I'm, I'm going to watch it on Facebook. So I hope, I hope uh, everybody. Uh, it's yeah, always a pleasure, Riley. Yep. <laughs> and the pleasure, pleasure is all mine. <laughs> I thought I was going to get eaten right there. <laughs> all right, I honestly that, thought I was going to get eaten. That, that just, that just made my day right there. Just to, just to, <laughs> just to have that interaction that totally just made my day. Well, l let me, uh, I'll, I'll jump in real quick before Riley has a chance to get back on Facebook. Uh, it's always scary to meet your heroes, right? Because, well, are they really as cool as they are on TV or on, you know, YouTube or on matches or it's always, it's always interesting meeting your, your heroes because, you know, what if they're not as cool as they actually are on TV or right? what happens on camera is or... not what happens in real life. <laughs> Raleigh is one of the people that he is, he is even more genuine which is, which is hard to, it's hard to think because he's so charming in his videos to begin with, but he is even better off the table. He is actually a really, really nice, smart, uh, funny guy in, in real life too. It's, it's, uh, he's one of the few that's, 
uh, they actually get better away from their content, which is pretty cool. That's awesome. And I hope people get to see that because this isn't edited. So exactly. <laughs> this is just raw, yeah. raw. E exactly. And that's yeah. why also um, I liked the fact that I started posting my APA matches that I had um, before we actually had the, uh, the shutdown because it's, it's, uh, it's to show people this is how I really play versus this is a lesson and it's a YouTube lesson where there's editing involved to where like, I want to be able to demonstrate to you what I'm doing and do I do it on the first attempt? Of course not. I have no shame in admitting that, but the lesson is still there because it's just up to me and my skill level to be able to demonstrate what I'm doing. But when you watch me in an APA match, there's no lesson. That's just raw. And whatever happens is whatever happens. Yeah, for sure. So uh, I think, I think the last question that I was going to have for you, uh, unless there's anything else you'd like to chat about, uh, what, so the future content, we had talked a little bit about uh, the mass day videos and, and then expanding upon the already existing videos, maybe going a little bit more in depth, but are there any other projects that you will have maybe on the horizon that you've always wanted to start or, you know, maybe even maybe in the last 30 minutes of chatting here, you, you thought maybe this would be a really cool thing to look into doing as well. Sure. So the as far as like everything that's just jumbling around in my head and then uh, taking the time to obviously try to produce the video because none of my stuff is scripted, um, by the way. Uh, when I say like I want to do or any of my videos that you watched, they're all done on the fly, meaning that that's why there's a crap ton of takes in between them because I might not like what I said in the first take, so I'll just say it again and choose different words and, and whatnot until finally it's all done. It's not like I'm sitting in my office here saying like, I'm going to say this and I'm going to say that and then this is what's going to happen and this, I don't do any of that. It's all done on the fly. Um, so other videos that I know that I have in mind, because um, like you said, the, the, the pool stuff can only go so far, so how do I keep it entertaining? Well, there are other types of pool games that are out there that aren't really uh, covered. I actually found that there's a golfing type game, and I don't mean the golf game that you play on a snooker table. Uh, we, we're all familiar with that. There's actually a golf-like style game uh, where you can play 18 holes of golf, and the idea is that you have a rack, and in that rack is a pattern of balls, and you have X amount of strokes to be able to finish that for the par basically and you play 18 different pattern racks and the, but when i say racks i don't mean all 15 balls are on the are in the rack there might be a pattern of three balls and i don't mean just the three ball uh pattern rack it could be you know one ball in each corner is a particular hole and you have x amount of strokes to be able to get uh, to get a par uh, I want to make a video about that. There's bolliards. I'm sure you've heard of bolliards before where you take a 10-ball rack and you do it like a bowling score. Uh, but not a lot of people are familiar with that. Um, as far as the other actual games that are out there, like One Pocket, I mean, I'm not a very good One Pocket player, but I understand the rules. So obviously showing something like that uh, would be in play. The closest three-cushion table uh, that I have is about an hour away from where I live. So if I ever get a chance to, to go over there and, uh, you know, grab the table for at least an hour and no one bothers me with, you know, the cameras and stuff going, because if I'm out in public and people see the cameras, they're obviously gonna be like, what's going on over here? And, you know, could, yeah, uh, right. <laughs> could, could possibly interfere. But to show to try to show three cush cushion billiards, I think would be fun. And of course, there's three cushion billiard matches that are out there. Uh, but those are done by professionals, not by average pool players. So, yeah, I, I have tons and tons of ideas. Uh, it's just, you know formulating them and, and of course having the time because I do work um, as, you know, as, a, as a software developer. So most of my YouTube uh, making time is only during the weekend. And that's when I actually have the time if I'm not participating in a tournament or just not hanging out with friends because my YouTube channel is my hobby. And I strictly try to keep it that way and not try to get consumed with the popularity that I've at least um, achieved uh, with where it's like, Oh, now I'm just going to do more because like, no, it's like, yeah. you know, I tried to do, I, I, I had the goal in mind of doing one video a week until I realized like this takes a lot of work to actually do it, it with, with the standards that I want to do it in. And now I've kind of reduced it to where like, maybe I might do one every other week or maybe once a month, you know, as long as I'm regularly putting content out there for hopefully that, uh, not only people can learn from, but obviously enjoy. I don't want to be like some sort of monetistic type of person that 
this like, oh, my, your video's, you know, insightful, but it's just so boring to watch. Well, like, oh, I want to try to be able to, to do both. And, you know, again, this is coming from comments and, you know, individuals like yourself, they're saying that I do a good job at that. So I just try to extenuate that um, as time goes by. Yeah, definitely. So I guess that's, uh, that's pretty much all the questions I had. Was there anything else that you'd like to chat about? Um, not that I uh, had in mind other than, you know, you know, you have your own exposure with the, uh, the podcast itself. Is there, are you, are you, you're in your apparel line is in conjunction with fast and loose designs. Does the cue it up podcast ever have any challenges as well? Or is it just all done by fast and loose designs? Yeah. So mostly, uh, so Chris Santana and I work together really closely, uh, on a lot of different things. Uh, we are pretty much tied to each other in a sense of there's some things that I'm good at that he relies on. And there's things that he's good at that I rely upon to the point where, you know, it, it gets to the point where like, if I need something done that he's good at, I just reach out to him and he does it. And if there's anything that he needs help with, uh, he reaches out to me and we, and I do it, I help him out. And the challenges are his thing and I help it in any sort of way that I can. Uh, so that is, I, I, basically just let him do that one gotcha. <laughs> as, uh, as I guess. And it's, and it's fun to be a part of, it's fun to, you know, give a couple prizes for it and use the platform to help him get it out there to some more people. But that's, that's definitely a fast and loose thing. And I, I love supporting it. And I think it's really cool to see a lot of different people trying to win these little prizes that, you know, they're not, it's a hundred bucks, but it's, it's practice too. I mean, you get some pretty cool practice sessions and two out of it. So absolutely. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I do, I got the, I got some apparel. Um, I do some, I do a lot of, well, I've done, I've done a couple of events. So like the Q and up cup, for example, if, if you uh, caught that, I don't know if you did or not. I think I, I think I saw something about the Q it up uh, uh, cup event. That's, that is, is, well, you know, if current events don't delay it, because uh, uh, I, I thought I saw something on Facebook uh, that there's something coming up. No. So we, uh, we did it about a month about a month ago maybe now okay uh and we, we were thinking about doing more of them but uh if things start opening up more uh, there's going to be a lot less interest in you know people are just going to go out and play so they're already be able to you know get their pool fix in without having to watch content so uh we put it out there basically as a way to i guess give some people that uh, that pool scratch i guess uh, people want to have pool content they want to be playing but if they right. can't play they want to consume it in some sort of way so this was a, a neat idea that we could all do it socially distanced, uh, you know, in our own homes, in our own houses, in our own countries. And, uh, and I guess, yeah, we were, we were playing from, uh, obviously Team USA was from all from the U.S. at the time, but uh, we had players from the Netherlands, uh, Italy, um, the U.K., uh, uh, Romania, Germany, and Spain. So, I mean, we had from all over the place, which was, which was fun. It was, it was, that one, that was a neat one. So that was a good way of getting some content out there as well. But other than that, I mean, the podcast is the podcast. I'm thinking about doing a little bit more of these live interviews. Uh, if, if people like them, I don't, I don't know how many, I don't know whether people like these more, or they like the audio form more. So people yeah. out there, reach out. <laughs> this, like this format right here was something that I was uh, eventually going to have to branch off into for my pool talk uh, episodes where I interview the, the local players around here. Uh, but I know eventually some people want to actually like appear on the channel, which I'm more than willing to, to support. And it would obviously have to be done in some fashion like this through a Zoom meeting or some type of, yeah. you know, webcam uh, type of meeting. But if it's any of my local players uh, within at least an hour to two hour drive, uh, to where um, I can go and set up my cameras and stuff that would be uh, done the same way. But this was going to be like the next step uh, to be able to do yeah. more interviews, especially because of current events. Yes. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, ultimately at the end of the day, uh, a lot like a lot like what you said, it's, it's doing what the people want you to do, right? They, there's a certain amount of content that they like and that they don't like, and they want more of the stuff they like, and they don't care about the stuff that they don't like. So a lot of it comes down to is, what do the people want to consume as far as pool content? And I would like to think I'm flexible enough that I would be able to do a lot of those things. 
Yeah, because like when I post any of my programming videos, I lose a pretty good handful of subscribers. But I mean, people watch it, people still comment on it. So I have an audience that appeals to those videos as well. Just I have more pool players than I have computer programmers. Of course. <laughs> so. Yeah, of course. <clears throat> Yeah. Well, uh, I guess, uh, is there anything else that you wanted to, to bring up or to talk about? Uh, not that I can think of. This has been a lot of fun. I mean, when I uh, did my first pool talk episode on myself to interview myself, I knew what I was going to ask <laughs> myself and I knew how I was going to answer kind of thing. So to, to have an unstaged interview for me was just, a, a, it was a pleasure to, to be on the podcast. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And I, I'm glad you said yes to it. Uh, I know I actually did never really seen your YouTube channel until actually you tagged uh, the podcast page. I'm not a big YouTube person, so I don't spend a lot. I don't spend a lot of time on social media anyways. I have to now for Facebook, but I, I just can't stand social media or, you know, YouTube or anything like that. I, I don't like spending a lot of time on it. So I'd actually never heard of you until you tagged me in the, uh, in the, the video you did. And at that, at that point in time, I went on a little bit of a I guess uh, a rabbit hole and watched a lot of your videos and it's, it's, it's cool content. So, yeah, well, it's, it's funny the way you mentioned that about never hearing of me, because when you requested me on Facebook, my instant response was who the heck is this? And then I go and look, <laughs> and I'm like, Oh, we have mutual friends. So maybe it's just yeah. another pool player. And then now we have, you know, this podcast episode. So <laughs> yeah, it's fun. Oh, and uh, here you go. Oh, wait, I gotta go to this one. This is my camera now. You probably can't read that. My beard is magnificent. <laughs> I <appreciate> <laughs> <it>. <laughs> That's so that, awesome. You know, it, a compliment like that is it's just the best. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, I guess at this point, uh, everybody out there that's been uh, tuning in and watching, thank you so much. Uh, I hope that you've enjoyed this. And little Chris, or little Chris, I should say. Uh, Either one go works. And subscribe to him on Facebook. He has uh, lots of great content. It can really help out your game. And, you know, if he's anything like me, I take my ego and my happiness is based off of the amount of subscribers I have. So maybe he's like me, maybe he's not. I need more subscribers too, or my sadness levels are going to go off the chains. <laughs> and make sure it's my YouTube channel. My Facebook uh, profile is, is more personal. So it's, it's my YouTube channel you want to subscribe to, not my Facebook. Yes, yes, I can, I can echo that one. All right. Well, thank you again, Chris. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me on. I, I really, I really enjoyed this. Yep. So till next time. Yep. Take care. So if you made it this far, let me personally say thank you for watching my interview on the Cue It Up podcast. I'd also like to thank Nate from Cue It Up for reaching out to me and asking me to appear on the podcast. And a special thanks goes out to Raleigh for taking the time out of his day to appear on the podcast with me. Now you should have an understanding of the amount of effort that I put into my videos that hopefully allow them to be educational to help improve your game as well as be entertaining. And as you heard in the interview, I still have plenty of ideas jumbling around in my head that I'll continue to publish as time goes by. So if you like what you saw, give this video a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe. And don't forget to subscribe to the Cue It Up podcast. Take care, everybody.